My name is Ben Black. I've been in venture capital for about 20 years in one shape or another. Um, my current fund is a, actually a secondary fund. So what we do is we wait till SaaS businesses are really successful, but you have 20 million in revenue, and we go and pro uh, provide early liquidity to either the early employees, the founders, uh, the early investors, whoever can't wait around uh, to, uh, to get the company liquid. So the key driver of my entire business is San Francisco real estate, all right? Like, so basically what happens is, you know, a, a, a couple goes, we need to buy a house, and the only way you get a down payment is like, you come to a guy like me, I go, hey, I can give you a down payment, expensive money, but I get your down payment. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it's a great business, and I did it because, you know, frankly, like, I'm probably one of the more negative people about venture capital that you'll ever see talk about venture capital in Silicon Valley. Uh, I want to ask you guys a question. If, if you took a look at every venture capital fund that's tracked by Prequin, which is kind of the big database that tracks performance of any fund that gets money from any public entity, uh, and those funds were from 2008 to 2010, when things were really bad and, and stock was cheap, right? So you think it's like the golden age of venture capital. And you went 10 years forward to today and asked yourself, for every dollar that went into one of those funds, uh, how much money did, did I get back, right? It's called DPI, distributed to paid in capital. Um, and ask yourself, what funds have actually gotten all the money I put back into the fund? If I got a dollar in, they get a dollar out. What percentage of venture capital funds do you think actually have given their investors their money back after eight to 10 years? Just their money back. Just their money back, no profit. I said less than 10%. Oh, you're not, you're even more negative than I am. Damn, <laughs> that's dark. It's 23%. 23%. Uh, well, it was about the time horizon. So uh, eight to 10 years, it's just not enough. Like, eight to 10 years, oh, that's, that's a scary thing. Right? Right, like, and this is, this is what I'm talking about. Yet, despite that fact, what has happened to the globe over the last 10 years? Just in, in a sort of macroeconomic sense. Countries have been printing dollars like crazy people. And then what happened is things started going pretty well in tech, right? So this is, what, this is the, basic, the basic driver of what we see in venture capital at the end of the day, is on a global basis, we've seen investor, the, you know, it's been up and to the right, okay? Stock market's been going up, and all this, these governments have printed tons of cash, and that cash has been sloshed around the system, and tech in general has been seen as a pretty good place to go get return, and they want to take money out of the stock market, the public markets, where they're marked to market every day and where performance is hard, and they want to put it in a different asset class. Uh, and it's venture capitalists, if you look at the industry as a whole, because this is kind of how you know, big asset managers look at the world, what you actually see is, despite the fact that if you look at like, individual funds, the whole industry has actually been producing pretty good returns as of late. See these, like this is capital, the dark blue is capital exited, and the light, the light uh, blue is capital raise. So recently, we see the situation where, as an industry, the, the industry has actually delivered uh, more money back than they've been taken down, which is actually is crazy because it doesn't really fit with the fund by fund returns. What happened in 2014? 2014 was like, it was a humongous year for tech IPOs, all right? So there's a whole bunch of companies that went public. And that, this includes things like life sciences, this includes China, um, and you just saw in 2014 an explosion of returns. And then, and that 20, it's good that you picked that up, because 2014 is the kind of like, the, the year that defines what happens next, all right? Which is that, Deals, money starts going up. Look at this. Returns are good from the investments made back here. Returns are good. And what happens here? The money goes from like basically almost doubles, so an average of like three million roughly, to like almost getting up to six in terms of early stage investment. And the number of deals is the yellow line, that kind of stays flat. So the money goes up, the amount of money goes up, number of deals stays flat, average deal, deal size goes up. Late stage, it's even more dramatic. Again, big money around the globe looking for a place to park it. They look at late stage venture capital, tons of businesses. 
We're going to take that money and we're going to put it onto people's balance sheets. And what you see is, again, same trend. 2013, you know, you're sitting around between, kind of talking $6 billion, and all of a sudden, boom, we get, good, we get a good 2014, and that money just stays up there. And then again, here you see like the number of deals go down. So we see the major trend, that I think the, you know, one of the most important trends to really think about if you're interested in SaaS, uh, funding SaaS businesses, is that these late stage big rounds are what's driving the industry right now. <clears throat> in software investment pace, which is relevant to you guys, it's even more dramatic, okay? We see, again, we go to capital invested, bouncing around around 15 billion into software, boom, up to 30 billion. Doubles, because of that good year, 2013, 2014, people were making money, and so it just attracts tons of capital here. But look at the number of deals, it goes down from 4,500 down to, down to 3,000. More money going into less companies, humongous late stage transactions. <clears throat> you see this in the transaction size data. So the dark blue is series D and on, so this is very late stage. Uh, series C is more of a growth stage. 2013 to 2014, deal sizes go 16, uh, for series D, 16 million up to 40. That is a lot, that's a really big difference. And 2013, 12 million up to 25, 2X. So what's the natural corollary if you have more money going into companies at the same point uh, in their lifestyle, life cycle, excuse me, you're gonna see pre-money valuations go way up. So the investors, they got a lot more money to put to work. They got a certain number of companies that everyone's going after, and they wanna invest that amount of money, and the size of the investment starts driving the transaction, because the entrepreneurs go, hey, I don't wanna give up more than 20, 25% of my business. So that 25%, ends up buying a lot, you know, you need a lot more money to buy that 25% than you used to. I mean, this is just shocking to me as an investor, and not in a good way. $97 million series, uh, series D pre-money valuations go from 97 million to 275 million. Pre-money valuations almost triple. Do you think that the exits are, are tripling? Do you think the money coming back is tripling? No. Now, we can sit there and say that the forward-looking uh, uh, factor is always like, what's VC fundraising doing? Like, how are they doing, uh, doing it now? And what you see is like the same trend again. 2013, you're, you're down in the six billion, all of a sudden, boom, you're up at 10. Then you're all the way up at 14, and then it's been bouncing around up there. We had some weakness at the last, last end of 2017, uh, you know, but it doesn't look like that is going to keep going. In fact, it looks like the money is going to keep coming in. So this industry has a fire hose of global cash pointed right at it. <clears throat> and it's going to get worse. In 2018, uh, if you look at the entire industry in 2016 and 2017, all of venture capital had about 60, 70 billion, then it goes up a little bit above 80 in 2017. Uh, recent mega funds, SoftBank, uh, Coastla, General Catalyst, Lightspeed, NEA, all local firms, SoftBank being the, the mother. Yeah, you guys heard of SoftBank? I mean, people know this? Okay. I mean, SoftBank is like insane, right? They go around $100 billion so that they can go in and jam all that money onto the, the, the uh, uh, balance sheets of private companies. And what do their competitors have to do? They have to raise out every more money. And so we're in this cycle now. So listen to this. Just these funds are already way bigger than the whole industry was before. Enormous transactions, piling money into the balance sheets of these late stage businesses. Now, where's all that money gonna go? How are we gonna get out? Venture capital IPOs, nah, it has not really changed very much, like it's sort of bouncing around between, uh, you know, 10, we had one good year in 2012. That was a year that's really this started and we started attracting a lot of capital after that. Um, it's been stronger now, but you know, we have so much money that like, how are you gonna get rid of it all? How, where, how, where are, they, how are these guys gonna get out? Liquidity, uh, you know, M&A liquidity, it's bouncing around. Like, again, you go back to 2014, it was a great year. But otherwise, that just kind of bounces around. So liquidity's not going up. The amount of money pouring in the industry is going in. What does that mean? <clears throat> Aging balance sheets. So, and this is what I get down to like, I think people, you know, this isn't the sort of part of my prayer remarks, but it's kind of fun to talk about in, the, in a group this small. I don't think any industry is more misunderstood than venture capital. 
I mean, people read about the exits and they, people read about, oh my God, he made like a thousand times his money. I, the, the truth about venture capital is it's very easy to make investments. It's even like relatively easy to raise money for venture capital. Like a lot of people do it. But it's really hard to get your money out. And what we're seeing here is a lot of people that are good at spinning stories, talking good game, putting more and more money into private companies, and the money is st sitting there stuck on the balance sheet. Um, so the total value of unrealized assets on the private company's balance sheets has gone up 2x since 2011. Money goes in, you don't get it out. All right? You have $500 billion of unrealized gains sitting on the, the balance sheets of venture capital firms, saying, hey, look, look at all the money we made. Unrealized. It's just sitting there. It's on a, it's on a report somewhere. Money goes in, it doesn't come out. And this is why I get back to the 2011 venture capital vintage. You know, on paper, it's total value of paid-in capital, which is the value of all of its assets by an accountant who goes through and says what all your company's worth in the private markets. 1.86, not too bad. Almost 2x in, you know, whatever, eight years, right? How much of the money have they actually sent back? Almost exactly the number I, I, I noted at the beginning, uh, 23 cents on the dollar. Money goes in, it doesn't come out. Now, the result is everyone wants to talk about unicorns, but what I like to track are whales. So unicorns you guys heard of, any company worth more than a billion dollars, there's another unicorn, this is awesome, <laughs> right? A whale, is my, in my definition, is in any company that has raised more than $100 million. Now, I know I'm gonna age myself. I was actually joined this industry in 2000, all right? I've been doing this in my 18th year in this industry. In 2000, like $100 million was a huge IPO. No company raised $100 million. If you raised $50 million privately, they'd be like, oh, it's a capital intensive business. What a mess. Now we have 800 companies, just the WeTrack, and that doesn't even count India and China, by the way, just the WeTrack, that have raised more than $100 million. Those companies are whales. And if I, tech, if I analyze the performance of those companies, about a third of them are doing well and have a shot at making their investors money. About a third, eh, we can't really tell right now, jury's out. A third are going to zero. A lot of money lost. And I, I think that if you're gonna be in the software business, one of the big things that you really have to realize is that the fact that a company has raised a lot of money is not an indicator that it's a great business or it's going to be successful. You really have to get beyond who their investors are. You have to get beyond the numbers because it's not that hard now. If you got you know, a couple of good quarters to go run up down Sand Hill Road or go to China or go to Hong Kong or, because it's a global business now and get somebody to give you $50 million. And if you're going to be out there working with these companies, you're going to have to figure that out, how to separate the good ones from the bads, because it ain't money anymore. The other thing that I think is dramatic, uh, and, it, and as all these funds got bigger, it created an open space for smaller funds. Uh, and in a way, it's like an incredible sort of testament to the quality of our economy, uh, how fast you know, the money rushes to fill in, the, fill in the new areas of opportunity. So there's been a humongous explosion of small micro funds. Uh, these are funds that have under $100 million of third-party third money that they've raised, but they're invested and run just like you know, regular venture capital firms. And this is, I mean, I'm seeing it super exciting because it's like, it's very diverse. You have a lot of people with very cool expertise. And you know, what happened was back in 2010, 2011, there was a couple of funds that got really successful and it became a thing with sort of institutional limited partners that they would go invest in these little guys. And all of a sudden, boom, huge numbers now, hundreds of funds that have been raised. And so you're out there counseling uh, you know, early stage companies or talking to early stage companies. Yeah, it's important to recognize that this industry has become massively more diverse than it was before. It was not just a few firms now, there's tons of funds and you really have to sort of dig them up. The other play, way it's got diverse is that corp, uh, corporate VCs have gotten into the game big time. Now, I used to think, uh, and this was true in the first couple bubbles I went through, that the peak of any bubble was when a sort of B quality public company would say would they would launch a corporate venture capital firm. You know, it'd be like, okay, we gotta go get into this VC game now that everyone else is succeeding at it. And be like, that's the peak, it's about to all crash, everyone hold on, all right? 
<laughs> now, I don't know, now I don't know. This thing just keeps on going. This, this bull market keeps on going. But you see massive in, increase in, uh, in corporate activity. Um, typically, that's a sign that the world is going to fall apart. But also it goes to my point about uh, how much more diverse this industry is in terms of the sources of capital that you can go to and the places you can find. Same thing with PE firms. So these are late stage firms coming in and buying much more mature businesses. They, you know, traditionally PE was something heavily focused on non-tech firms. You know, you go buy, you know, your manufacturing companies and things like that. But more and more for companies who can't get out, uh, you know, your, your $100 million software company, you're growing 20% a year. Now PE firms are coming in and buying those. And finally, international. Global macroeconomic, macroeconomic policy creates massive liquidity all around the globe. That liquidity used to be very stuck within countries. It's become mobile, and a lot of it is coming here. And so you go, to go from 3.9% of venture deals to almost 20 uh, in, in just, what, eight years, that's really is an extraordinary transfer, uh, extraordinary, uh, adds an extraordinary level of complexity and uh, the number of people who are in the game, the number of, of sources of capital you can go to has never been higher, but it's also much more unpredictable. These types of non, the, the regular players, the people who aren't, aren't in the game, the irregular players, the people who come when things are good, you know, the corporate VCs, your international investors, they're the first people to, to, to hightail when things are bad. Uh, so if you're out there thinking about funding businesses, you, by all means, like these are great sources, but always make sure that you have some groups that have been through a cycle or two, they're really down. Because in my experience, uh, especially the corporate VCs, they're there with, when it's going well. But the second it turns south, there's some CFO somewhere that goes, you know, if we sold this out at a loss, it's worth more to us uh, to sold you know, at a loss than dead, uh, dead to us than alive, right? And that, that's why they make poor um, VC investors, because they don't stick with VC over the cycle. I, Mm-hmm. They just go, they sell, they sell it to guys like me. That's part of my business. But, but Josh is fine. Josh is fine. Josh is fine, but he, he's lost that. It, first of all, whenever you have investors that want to get out of your company privately, it's, it creates a lot of stress and chaos within your capital base, right? Uh, and you want, by and large, companies that are going to be with you, uh, investors are going to be with you through good and bad, right? And I've just seen that the corporates are the, some of the most fickle and destructive investors over a long period. They can be great too, they can make companies. But you, you, are never, you never know who's gonna be running that firm three or four years down the road. And you never know who's gonna be pulling decisions because it's just, it's not like a fund where people are working there for their careers. Like, that's just a job, it's typically just a job. And that's why also you should distinguish between certain types of, of corporate VCs. So if you, some corporate VCs, like Disney was, had this firm Shamrock for a long time uh, that, was, that, that was in the game and they, they were separately funded. They were run just like an independent venture capital firm. The people who ran it had economics and the long-term success of it. Uh, no CFO could just pull their money out. That firm, they did really well for a very long time. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you can think about WAMU, uh, Washington Mutual, you remember that bank? You know, well that, they had a venture capital firm that put like hundreds of millions of dollars into firms. And they were you know, sold out for pennies and dollars when WAMU ran into trouble um, because it was on the balance sheet. So I'd be, always be like careful when you're taking balance sheet money from, from corporates that they're not, and just be recognized that they're not gonna act like a long-term private equity investor is gonna act who's running his own firm for, through, through good times and bad. That's my only point, but great question. Not the presentation, yeah. but I think the point is that is good for your business. Oh, it's great. Because you no. pennies on Yeah, when, we, when I see new corporate venture capital right. firms, the, I call them uh, uh, secondary embryos. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So, you've got equity on, on the cheap. Right, yeah, that's, that's my business. But, I mean, and it's not a huge part of my business because it's sure. so cyclical. Yeah, and yeah, and it's, you know, it comes when you market crashes. So you, know, you saw a lot of that in you know, 2009, 2010. That was the place to be. It was just picking up corporate destroyed. You know, I, I want to walk away from my venture portfolio. Yeah. Does that yeah. do it? So in the example from before, does that do anything to... Can you guys hear him back there? You want us to... Yeah. So the question is, if um, Josh gets uh, debt from a, mm -hmm. a corporate VC yep. and things go south and, and you're, you're picking up uh, the, the debt pennies on the dollar, does, 
does that impact his valuation in any way? Um, not really. Uh, so typically, so typically the companies, if the portfolio is selling the portfolio assets, it's actually a transaction that's separate from, from, from the from the actual ownership of the assets themselves. So if I if I have a portfolio of 50 companies that are worth, that's worth 100 million dollars, and I sell them for 50 because I have to, and it's you know being held on you know some theoretical books at 100, you know that doesn't impact what the value of the company the companies are that are in the portfolio. Um, it is optics. It can matter for optics, um, but it doesn't have a you know in a sort of uh, accountant sense any impact. So it's more of a PR issue for me. At, yes. In the short term, but mm -hmm. in the long term, when I go to raise money at the next round, it, it doesn't potentially. Yeah, that's where the, maybe neither. Yeah. That's where the global market is. It just depends. It also depends on what the specific situation is. Yeah. If the problem is if it's corporate who's selling out of a portfolio that's got you know 50 assets in it. Anybody's going to look at that and go, "That's not about the company," you know. That's not about the individual company, right. uh, you know. It can, but it can happen. So that's the PR yeah. Thing there. Right. Yeah. Did you have a question? No, yeah. It's about the corporate. Yeah. Right. It's about the corporate. Um, and so, I mean, the the end result. Of, what's the end result of all this? And then, you know, I'd love to answer any questions you have. Um, the end result of all this is that the life cycle for companies is getting longer. Uh, what, how long it takes you to get through the process to get longer, where you're supposed to be is being, in terms of your company metrics, is, is going out farther and farther. So here we have percentage of companies generating revenues the time they get to series A, B, and C. And what you see is in 2011, you had venture capital firms, like you know, real venture capital firms. This isn't like seed investors or like microfunds. This is like your standard sort of series A kind of companies. Um, you had those guys coming in, you know, doing series A, C, A, and B basically when it, everything was kind of pre-revenue, right? Like if you look down here, you know, uh, nine percent, eleven percent of the companies were generating revenue at time uh, time of Series A and Series B. Excuse me, Series time of seed and Series A. Uh, that number now goes up to fifty to sixty-seven percent. That is, uh, that is, and again, this is all being driven by the fact that you have to put more and more money to work. There's more of a bias towards more mature companies. So for you to get that money, you have to be more mature. Um, and that is a fundamental change in the way that companies are financed. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is a lot of people are rushing in to fill in the voids and all those microfunds and all these like, you know, there's a lot of, of, of money still there. But the traditional industry has moved upstream. It's gotten to bigger companies, bigger transactions later in a company's life cycle. Uh, and that's why you say also the same thing, the, the ex very vast explosion of the size of transactions. Uh, Typical uh, seed deal going from 1.4 million to 6.3 <laughs> seed, 6.3. I just actually had a uh, venture capitalist. I just sent a guy. I'm a seed investor in a company. It's doing really well. It's got three million, um, three million dollars of revenue, uh, and I went went to like what I would consider to be like a very classic C, C, uh, a C Series A firm, and a guy I've known for years. But he's old school. He's a guy like he tried to hire me when I was like 27, and he's very much in like the old model. And I was like, hey, these guys are raising money. You know, Series A, blah, 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 these three million of revenue, like very much consistent with this. And he got out and sent me this snotty, snotty back, snotty email back. He said, we don't do $10 million Series A's. All snotty. I'm like, sorry, man, that's the world. <laughs> like, that's the world. That's the average size of a Series A now. Uh, so and what does this mean for, for, and I'd love to answer any questions you have, because like, that's pretty much what I got. But, uh, uh, you know, the industry, I, on one hand, I, I kind of like, it used to be this cottage industry that everyone knew each other. You kind of like had, had this world of like, you, you kind of understood the set of rules. And in the last seven, six, seven years, you know, things have really changed. The industry has become massively global. Uh, you know, we're seeing firms that are going up. All of a sudden, you know, a Silicon Valley firm is, thinks that they're doing a deal and some corporate is doing a $100 million transaction. Um, it's global, it's big, and it's become more and more diverse uh, at the low end, which I think is actually a really great thing for the industry. Uh, I run a conference called Raise, uh, which is actually next week, which is a conference for 300 uh, emerging venture capitalists, people starting their own funds, so all those micro funds. And it's incredible because like 35, 40% of our attendees are women versus today it was like 5% or 7% of GPs of VC firms are women. Uh, so I think that's awesome. And so there's like some really good things about the industry. And there's some, but I think that this, the core problem uh, that there's a massive amount of money is going into these late stage businesses and that money has nowhere to go. 
There aren't enough IPOs to, get, to take that money off. There aren't enough M&A opportunities. And now we're going to see more and more private companies that are going to have nasty, mean kinds of transactions later in the life. Uh, just today, a company called Birchbox in New York uh, got totally recapped out. I own like $150 million of, of investors' money just went up, uh, up in the air. Um, and we've lost this sense of sort of like, I mean, these things are just happening all the time, and $100 million are being evaporated here and there, and it doesn't even make the Wall Street Journal anymore. So don't, read, don't believe what you read in the paper. And this is a, a business of, uh, that has got some really good things. We've seen some great companies go public. But there is a lot of money that just is stuck there for a very long period of time and will be as far as we can think, see it in the future. And with that, any questions? So why are VCs continuing to pump enormous amounts of money if they can't get it out? Well, why there's does it, this there incredible thing called management fees. <laughs> so, Kosla raised a $3.3 billion fund. I mean, not to pick on Kosla, but I'm just using an example. Uh, what's 2% of $3.3 billion? How many partners are, are dipping into that? Five? Four? Because these, these, these firms are exploding in size, and it's not like they go hire 25 more people and split because keep the number the same. They double in size, and they keep the number of partners the same. Maybe they add one. Maybe they add one. 665 million. 60, 60 something million. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Divided by five? Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and this is a business, look, the VC business is a, is a lot like, it's a lot like the entertainment business, right? You have a small number of people who control a massive amount of the capital uh, who actually don't always deliver a lot of the gains. I mean, I've seen the returns of these late stage funds. And if you, you know, they're, they're not that exciting. I mean, if you have a fund that's actually like a delivered you know, your money back after five or six years, like you're considered to be a top performer, all right? And, and the reason is it says more about the global opportunities for capital investment than it does about VCs themselves, I think, because everyone kind of knows this and everyone does it anyway. And, I mean, I, I would never put my money into a VC fund that had more than $200 million. It's like, you, you just have to have so much liquidity come back. I don't think it's, I mean, I think it's very hard to predict. And it's a lot of concentration as well. Yeah. Find. Sorry, if you can find some of the, I've been doing this for a long time myself, so on the other side of the end. So who are you? Uh, my name is Hans, and uh, my first capital raise was in 87. Great. So I've done it four times over these different time periods. I had a specific question for you, or, yeah. for you here. But um, very often you hear the big announcements about how there is a, uh, a merger. You know, I have always enjoy looking for the common partner on both boards and kind of looking behind where the exit comes from absolutely and there's a lot of that um, sort of interconnectivity driving the the industry for sure absolutely one, one question I had was um, dot-com era raised a bunch of money and obviously the rounds were front-loaded due to the cost of setting up um, mm -hmm. um, large cloud slash SaaS yeah. operations uh, you see a lot of entry-level money now because of the efficiencies you know, being made smaller, a lot more education also about lean startups and mm -hmm. everything. Everybody's yeah. saying, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a mistake to take too much money. So when you look at this phenomena with a larger seed capital, does this include other non-cloud? This is oh, a, a sure, general, yeah. This right? is just so, generally. Generally. Yeah. So this okay. is, uh, and, you know, I, I, I always hear this like, uh, this is like one of those things that VCs say all the time about, oh, it doesn't cost anything to start a company just like, you know, write some code and put it up on AWS and you're off to the races, right? Um, and, but you know, what really, it, uh, it, what it doesn't, sh it, it, the companies have become so much more expensive to actually be created. Like the number of bootstrap businesses that go public and the amount of capital that, is, that, co that private companies, in particular cloud companies, have raised by the time they go public, if you just look at that and say, 
where is the capital efficiency that we're supposed to be talking about here? Because it's, I don't see it. Well, it's, it's being it's, spent on sales and marketing. That's right. right? It's shifted, it's yes. shifted now, from the product costs, and infrastructure costs have, of people and, sales and, market. Yeah. And, and people costs. That's, that's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. Absolutely true. I, but I just like these you know, people who, VCs who say, oh, we only invest in capital efficient businesses. And I'm like, nah, all of your successful businesses have raised more than $100 million. You kind of like, kind of want to stop talking about capital efficiency, my friend. Oh. You know? Yeah, it's shifted for sure. Certain yeah. things are more efficient, Absolutely. but other things because yes, of the no amount more, of so noise. No more big sun boxes. Yeah, no big sun boxes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's all cloud, just all on cloud. time, spend the, just the money you need, but then everything that's done you know, for marketing purposes to try to get past the noise yes. is, is definitely gone up. And also it's just like uh, you're really sure destruction stuff. because at every space that you have, you know, all of a sudden you have five competitors that are doing the same thing, and so the one way you try to win is that I'm going to I'm going to outspend my competitors. Yeah, bit higher on AdWords. Right. Watch that hit the floor doing nothing. Great. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so oh, much. You. Really appreciate it, Ben. Thanks, guys. Let's give Ben a hand. Thanks for sticking around. <laughs> I really appreciate it.